Well, good morning. Welcome to Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. Today, my topic is servants who rule. Servants who rule. Hope you are having a great morning. I am going to seek to spend a few moments dissecting this idea. Yesterday, I was going through Genesis 24 and came, a came across a verse, and the phrase stood out to me in a very unique way. And uh, today, I want to seek to speak about the subject of, of serving but there's a way to serve. There's some servants who are ruled over. And then there are other servants who actually rule. And then there are rulers who don't serve and rulers that do. And so one of the truths that I see running throughout all of the scriptures is the idea of uh, what I call tension. Tension in the scriptures where two things appear to be true at the same time. In other words, uh, over and over again, we are called servants of the Lord. But what type of servants should we be, right? What type of leader should I or you be? And so I want to look at this topic as quickly as I can, as briefly as I can. And I want to say that if you, every one of us are uh, servants in some capacity, and every one of us are rulers in some capacity, right? You may not see yourself as a ruler, but you are. You may not see yourself as a servant, but you are, right? All of us are servants and all of us are rulers. But the question is, who, who are you serving or what are you serving? And, and who, who are you ruling over or what are you ruling over? All right, so that's going to be my topic for this morning. And um, I want to say that if you are not, right, that, uh, that, that as a servant, if you are not a servant that rules, a servant that rules, that uh, it's going to have an impact upon how you rule. And if you're not a ruler that serves, it's going to have an impact upon the way you uh, rule. In other words, a servant who doesn't rule is weak, unpredictable, inconsistent, undisciplined, and can often be unfaithful. A servant who doesn't rule is weak, unpredictable, inconsistent, undisciplined, and can often be unfaithful. The ruler who doesn't serve has a tendency to be rigid, overbearing, domineering, uh, insensitive to others, um, and on and on we can go. So these are a few thoughts that I jotted down as I thought about this text. And uh, the text is Genesis chapter 24, verse 2. It says, And Abraham said unto his, said unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had. I want you to think of that phrase. That Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had. So his servant that ruled over all that he had. Okay, I want you to keep that in mind as you think of this, as you think, think of this topic, okay? So servants who rule. Are you a servant that rules? Are you a ruler that serves? I want to pray. Father, I want to thank you this morning for another day of life. Thank you for the mercy of God. Thank you for the power of your spirit. Thank you for the anointing that breaks and destroys every yoke in our life. Thank you that no weapon formed against us can prosper, and every tongue that rises up against us in judgment shall be condemned. Thank you for the truth of your word that says, Behold, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt or harm you. Father, I'm asking this morning that you would fill me with your spirit. From the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. I pray that the words that I speak today would be spirit and life. I pray that, Lord, your anointing would break and destroy yokes in my life. And in the life of every hearer of these words this morning. I ask, Father, that as I seek to look at this idea of servants who rule. That you will bring this idea to life for me and for others. Holy Spirit, I invite you to come and to glorify the Son of God. Glorify yourself. Let your will be done, Lord, in earth, even now, as it is done in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Servants who rule. That's my topic for the day. Servants who rule. Are you a servant that rules? Are you a ruler that serves? There's tension here. And uh, again, if you're going to please God, you need to do both. It's not enough just to serve if you are not ruling in some and uh, other areas of your life. All of us are serving. 
All of us are ruling. The question is, who and what are you serving, and whom and what are you ruling or ruling over? All right, so Genesis 24, 2, it says, And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. The eldest servant of his house ruled over all that he had. I want you to notice the phrase, servant that ruled over all. Abraham was about 140 years old, and he is seeking a wife for his son, Isaac. He doesn't trust Isaac to be able to identify his spouse on his own. And so he says to his eldest servant, the oldest servant in his house, the one that's been with him, I think possibly the longest, that has rule over everything in his house, according to this text, according to Genesis 24, verse 10 as well, and Genesis, uh, I think, 15, 1 and 2, if it's the same Eliezer. This servant has rule over everything, and Abraham says to his servant, I want you to go and I want you to find a wife for my son Isaac. And notice the phrase. He says, And Abraham said unto his eldest son, or servant, of his house, that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. So the first thing I want you to notice is this man was able to follow commands. He was a true servant. He was under the authority of a man named Abraham who had many servants. And when Abraham says to him, I want you to put your, I pray thee, he's begging him, he's beseeching him, he's exhorting him, I want you to put your hand under my thigh. This, is, this was believed to be, or is believed to be, a covenant of some kind that's being made. This is like swearing at, a, at the highest level. So Abraham wants him to commit to go out and find a wife for his son. And verse, 20, verse 3 says, And I will make thee swear by the Lord. And so when he says, I want you to put your hand under my thigh, he's saying to, to his servant, I want you to commit to me, I want to be able to trust you, that when I send you on this errand, as a servant, that you're going to do what I ask you to do. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, there are other gods that are not the God of heaven and the God of, of the earth. And so often the scriptures, the scriptures identify the God of the Bible by describing him as the God of heaven and earth or the creator of heaven and earth. I want you to swear not by any God, but I want you to swear by the God of heaven and the God of earth that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Abraham was so concerned about his son being influenced by the Canaanites who represented the world that he wanted his eldest servant, who was much more prudent, who, who understood, who was much more discreet, wiser than his son Isaac, he wanted him to go out and find a wife for his son without without he wanted them to be faithful he wanted to be able to trust him in doing that and so here was a servant that could be trusted a servant who ruled a servant who was faithful and little again abram abram said unto his eldest son of his house that ruled over all that he had the bible says if we are faithful and little god will make us rulers over much Remember I said that every one of us is a ruler. We rule, we rule over something, and every one of us is a servant. We rule over something or someone. The question is, what are you ruling over? What am I ruling over? And who and what are we serving? And so this servant could be trusted to go and find a wife for Abraham, Abraham's son. Abraham trusted him. But he trusted him so much as a servant that he made him ruler over all that he had. This man was a ruler over all of his house. Earlier in the book of Genesis, this was one of the concerns of Abraham. Abraham has no sons. He has no one to inherit all that he has produced. He has many possessions and he has no one to inherit. And he's concerned and he goes to God in Genesis 15 verses 1 and 2, I believe it is. And he has concern that, listen, I have no son, and my servant is going to inherit everything when I die. 
And so he pleads to God to give him a son because the oldest son or the only son inherits what you have left. So here's my point today, and this is my nugget of wisdom. Are you a servant who rules? You need to be a servant who rules over others. I'm sorry, a servant that rules. You need to be a servant to others, a servant to God, a servant to truth. We need to be servants to God, servants to others, and servants to truth. And then we need to rule over self, over sin, and over Satan. And so the question is, as I take a few moments to try to expound on this, are you ruling over sin? Are you ruling over self? Are you ruling over Satan? Are you a servant to others, a servant to God, and a servant to truth? What kind of servant are you? What type of ruler are you? What type of master are you? What type of parent are you? What type of husband are you? What type of employer or employee? See, this is very practical because it's seen in every area of our life. And as I said in my opening, servants who don't rule, servants who don't rule are weak. Servants who don't rule are unpredictable because there's no consistency. Servants who don't rule are inconsistent. Servants who don't rule are undisciplined and unfaithful. And so let's begin first by looking at servants that rule. Number one, we must be a servant that rules, a servant. First, we must be a servant to others. And this is not in any particular order, but we must be a servant to others. A servant to others. Now, I don't care what capacity of rulership you have. I don't care what type of authority you possess. If you are not a servant to others, you are and cannot please God. If you are not a servant to others in your domain of rulership, your domain of leadership, the places where you take dominion, you are and cannot be a true servant of God. You will not please God if you don't know how to rule by serving. The Bible says about Jesus that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. As a ruler, one that had all authority, he was able to serve others. In Galatians 5.13, Paul says to the Galatians, You have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion for the flesh. In other words, you have a liberty and a freedom in Jesus Christ, but don't use that freedom to be a greater sinner. Don't use that freedom to do things that may be lawful, but can become sinful. You ever heard these arguments and discussions among God's people? Is it okay for Christians to have tattoos? Is it okay for a Christian to watch R-rated movies? Is it okay for Christians to drink alcohol? Is it okay and you fill in the blank? And there's this sort of idea that if I have freedom and liberty to do something that I am okay with doing it. The Bible says all things are lawful, but all things are not profitable. All things are lawful, all things are not expedient. All things are lawful, but I will not be mastered by anything, Paul says. And so the question is not whether or not something is okay to do or it's lawful to do. That would be Hinduism. That would be Islam. That would be Buddhism. Christianity is not just concerned about whether it's right to do, Christianity is concerned about whether it is profitable to do, whether it is helpful to do, whether it is expedient to do, whether it can put you in bondage. Coffee is free and liberal. And I mean, you know, we have freedom. I can drink coffee. I can eat as much. I can eat food. Food is lawful, but I can become in bondage to food. I can be addicted, addicted to food. I can be mastered by food. Paul says, I will not be mastered by anything. And so first, we must be a servant to others. And this text says, don't use your liberty for an occasion for the flesh. Don't use the freedom you have to be able to enjoy more fleshly desires. But by love, serve one another. So don't use your freedom to possess more, to get more, to do more. That makes me feel good. But here it says, but by love we should serve one another. So first of all, it doesn't matter what capacity of rulership you are in, 
if you want to please God and you want to serve the Lord, you need to be a servant of others. You need to be a servant of others. Secondly, not only are we to be servants of others, we're to be servants of God. We're to be servants of God. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. Paul is encouraging the Thessalonians. And he says, How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's the description of a Christian. The description of a Christian is one who turns from idols to serve. One who turns from idols to serve the living and true God. And so, to be a servant that rules, we must first serve others. Secondly, we must serve the true and living God. And in order to serve the true and living God, you and I must turn from the idols in our life. The Bible says covetousness is idolatry. Colossians 1 verse 5. We have a tendency when we think of idolatry, we think of uh, bricks, trees, stones, objects. Well, those are some idols, but there are other idols that can take idols. There are other idols that can be part of our lives. And anything that's more important to me or anyone that's more important to me than God is, can be or has become an idol. It depends. And so this text says they had turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God. That's called repentance. We live in a day where people say you don't have to give up anything to be a Christian. That's not true. You have people say things like come as you are. That's not in the Bible. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. There's nowhere in the Bible it says, come as you are. It says, come unto me, all ye that are burdened down with the cares of this life and sin on your back. Come unto me and I will give you rest, Jesus says. And so, yes, I know what people mean when they say, come as you are. The idea is you can't change yourself, so don't try to change yourself before you come to the Lord. Well, say that. Right? You can't change yourself. But this text says that these people turned to God from idols. And so one thing they were able to do is they were able to recognize and identify the things in their life that competed with the God of the Bible, the idols in their life. They were able to turn from their idols, first to God, to turn from their idols. So the motivation was to turn to God. It wasn't just to turn from or to repent they were to turn to God, but in order to turn to God, they needed to turn from their idols. And so it says that they turned from their idols to God from idols to serve the living and true God. If you're going to be a servant that rules, a servant who rules, you need to serve others, regardless of whatever capacity you, you're in. Many pastors are in leadership and want to be served. That's not biblical. Peter says in 1 Peter 5 that the servant, the pastor, the preacher, those who are in leadership are not to, to dominate and rule over other people in a domineering way. Fathers, we're not to provoke our children to wrath. How do we do that? By not serving them. We provoke our children to wrath when we rule without serving. When we rule in a way that we expect you to meet our needs. I want you to meet my needs. I want you to make me happy. I want you to obey what I say and do what I say. And I am not going to at all deny myself and serve you. Husbands, same thing, right? Men, men submit to their wives by love. Wives submit to their husbands through uh, being subjected to them. And so we, we submit too because we have to deny ourselves as husbands if we're going to lay down our lives for our wives, we're submitting ourselves to their need. So men submit to a man, a woman's need, to a woman's need, and the woman submits to, I forget how that's said, I'm not going to say it because I don't want to get it wrong, but the point is, men submit as well. And so, to be a servant that rules, we have to serve others, we have to serve God, and then we have to serve the truth. Serve truth. The Bible says in Romans 6, 17, that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. 
See, the word of God should be obeyed from the heart. In order to obey, you must serve. This text says, you were the servants of sin. The opposite of serving sin is to serve or to obey the truth. So this text reminds us that the truth is not just something we need to learn. The truth is not just something we need to know. But the truth must be obeyed. So to be a servant that rules, we must serve others, we must serve God, we must serve the truth. Galatians 5, 7, as Paul is speaking to the Galatians, he says, you, you used to run well. You did run well. Who hindered you that you should not obey the truth? What happened Why you stop obeying what the truth said or says? And so to be a servant who rules, we must serve others, we must serve God, and we must serve the truth. Again, Genesis 24, 2. Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. Be a servant that rules. Be a servant who rules. Be a servant who rules. Secondly, to be a servant who rules, not only do we need to serve others, serve God, and serve the truth, but we need to rule. We need to rule over self, we need to rule over sin, and we need to rule over Satan. Now, sometimes, in certain circles, you can hear so much teaching on the need to be, the, 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 um, to be servants, and the need to be humble, that we forget that there is an authority that we must and should have in God. And so we allow certain things in our life and certain things to dominate our life that, we, that are not the will of God, that should not be dominating who and what we are. But we have come to believe certain things about serving, about the virtue of serving, that we so highlight the, the idea of being a servant, of being humble, of being pliable, of being compliant, that we forget that we're also to rule. When God created Adam and Eve in the garden, he created them to take dominion. That has never changed. And you and I are to rule, not over others, not over people, but we are to rule over self, we are to rule over sin, and rule over Satan. First, ruling over self. Proverbs 25, verse 28 says, He that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down and without walls. You and I, in order to be rulers who serve and servants who rule, we have to serve, we have to, sorry, rule over ourself. If we don't rule over ourself, our selfish desires will cause us to rule over others. If I and you don't know how to deny self, then we are tempted to take advantage of others. We're tempted to, to uh, abuse authority. If I don't learn to rule over self, then authority becomes abused. Right now, Facebook is in somewhat of hot water, right? Mark Zuckerberg right now is being questioned. And I watched a, I watched a short video last night of uh, Ted Cruz, one of the senators, Republican senators, questioning and grilling Mark Zuckerberg. And one of the things he alleged is that Facebook has been actively removing and censoring anything that is conservative or Republican in nature. Now, America is America because America does not silence the voice of others. Freedom of speech. I may disagree with you, doesn't matter. You still can give me your point. You, your point of view is still valid. When that is destroyed, we have abused authority. And if these things are true, as it appears to be true about Facebook, then this is a case where authority, right? Monopoly, I love the game Monopoly, right? But authority in this case has led, appears to have led to abuse. And this is what happens often when people are in authority if you forget that the purpose of being in authority is to serve others. See, the way business works, you build business not by looking to do your own thing or meeting your own needs or making your own money. You will produce money based on how you serve the marketplace. So the better you serve the needs of others, the more 
money you're going to make. That's how business industry works. That's how the world works. And so sometimes authority can cause us when we are not ruling over ourselves, our own appetites, our own covetousness, our own desire to meet our own needs, we end up ruling in a way that becomes rigid. We rule in a way that causes us to be overbearing and domineering to others. This can be seen in a parental relationship when the parent is only ruling in a way to get the child to do what I say or else. Well, now you become domineering. Because you lose sight of the fact that as a parent, the goal of parenting, at least, is to train them up to be good citizens, good adults. To train them how to be subject to those that are in authority. Not just to my authority, but the authority of the land, the authority of the government, the authority of their teachers, and so on. The authority of the employer that they may work for at some point. But most importantly, you want to train them up to be subjected to and submissive to God. And so when we are not ruling over ourselves as rulers, we end up being overbearing, being domineering, being insensitive to others. And what happens is we forget that we're in that ro role to serve. The Bible says if we are faithful over little, God will make us ruler over much. Every ruler is made. Rulers are not born. Rulers are made. God says all authority is of God. He's the one that places people in authority. He's the one that puts people in authority. You don't like President Trump? Get over it. God placed him there. You don't like Nero in the first century? Get over it. Yes, he's burning, he's lighting up Rome by burning up Christians, lighting them up as torches. You think things are bad in America? <laughs> things are not bad in America compared to the first century for the Christians in Rome. The amount of them that were put to death... And so sometimes we get distracted. All authority is of God. Now, sometimes God places authority as judgment. Sometimes God places authority for blessing. But let him, the, let him deal with his role and his purposes as to why he puts certain authority over us. The point is, if I am under authority, I should be sub submitted to that authority. And if I am the authority, I should never get to the point where I am serving my own lusts and my own desires and not serving God others. And so first of all, if you're going to be a ruler that serves, you need to rule over self. I need to rule over self. Secondly, we need to rule over sin. Rule over sin. In the Bible, sin is described as a person. Sin is personified. Sin is our greatest enemies are sin, self, and the world of flesh and the devil. The world of flesh and the devil. The world puts before us temptations to sin. And the devil puts before us temptations to sin. But you and I have to learn how to rule over ourselves and rule over sin. In Genesis 4-7, God comes to Cain. And he says to Cain, God says, If you do well, you will not, should, should you not be accepted? Cain is disgruntled. Cain is murmuring and complaining. Cain is upset because Abel's sacrifice and sacrifices have been accepted and his were rejected. And so he's like a little child that's, that's uh, moping around the house and nobody loves me and nobody cares for me. And you're not fair, God. You're not fair. How come, how come Abel's sacrifice is accepted and mine is not? And God reminds Cain that the reason you are in the situation you're in is because you're not taking full responsibility for your own results. Don't blame me. Don't blame others. Don't blame Abel. Blame yourself. Genesis 4, 7. If thou, when I say blame yourself, by the way, I'm not talking about having negative feelings about yourself. I'm talking about taking responsibility for yourself and for the outcome. God says, if thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted. In other words, you know what you're supposed to be doing, Cain. Don't blame Abel for being his sacrifice being accepted and yours being rejected. If you know what to do. If you do what you're supposed to do, I would accept your sacrifice. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shall rule over... It doesn't say rule over it. 
God says, thou shall rule over him. Sin in the Bible is described as a person. It is personified. It is an active, living, vibrant mechanism, always knocking at the door of the child of God, seeking to take dominion over the child of God to cause us to submit to it or him so that we fall into sin and temptation. God says, Cain, sin is at your door and it's knocking. And it's looking for a door of opportunity to come into your life and to cause you to fall. But you have a choice to say no to it, to resist the temptation, not to give in. And so rulers who serve must not only rule over self, we must learn to rule over sin. God says sin is knocking at your door, but thou shalt rule over him. Now, to my Calvinistic friends, sometimes we take the Bible too far. No? Yeah. Sometimes we take doctrine too far. Cain is in a fallen state. Cain has not been redeemed. Cain does not have the Holy Spirit. Yet God expects Cain to be able to say no to the sin that wants him to kill his brother. The Bible says in Romans 1 that's, that the law of God is written on our hearts. In Romans 2 it says our conscience bears witness with our spirit so that we are without excuse. That no man, no woman, no boy or no girl would be without excuse, would be with excuse on the day of judgment because we didn't know better by sinning against God. We may not know fully God's law. But the basics of God's law, the bent of God's law, is written on the heart of all men, women, boy, and girl. You can go to the most obscure part of the world, and they know that murder is wrong. They know that taking someone else's property, stealing, is wrong. In some countries, they cut off your hand for stealing. It may not even be a religious country. So the law of God is written on our hearts. But here, God expects Cain to be able to rule over the sin that wants to dominate him. Now, it doesn't say every sin, but at least it says that, And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. God expects Cain to rule over the sin that's knocking at his door. But, sin, but, but he does not rule over that sin. He submits to it and ends up killing his brother. And so rulers who serve, my point to those that believe, in the doctrines of grace, don't take understanding of Scripture or truth beyond what the Scripture teaches. Beyond what the Scriptures teach. And so, the only thing I would say here is sometimes we spend so much time telling people what they can't do that they start believing it. You can't do it. You're an able. You can't come to the Lord. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't serve God. You can't resist sin. You can spend so much time hammering and beating that drum that you cause the person to so believe it that now they don't obey the commands of Scripture, which is to seek the Lord while he may be found. Repent from your sins. Choose this day whom you will serve. Sometimes we can take our understanding of Scripture beyond what the Scriptures actually are teaching. And so Paul, uh, uh, God says here that uh, Cain was to rule over sin. And if you and I are going to be rulers who serve, we need to rule over self, rule over sin. And lastly, but more briefly, we need to rule over Satan. Rule over Satan. Rule over Satan. Luke 10, 19, Jesus says, Behold, I give, you, give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. This was given to his disciples. I don't think this command was just given to the apostles. This was given to his disciples. If you are a disciple, a follower, a true follower of Christ, or as John 8 says, a disciple indeed, if you and I are disciples indeed, then we should have rule over Satan, power over the enemy. I'm not talking about commanding and rebuking the devil. I'm talking about walking in truth. I'm talking about putting on the armor of God and living in such a manner that we don't have to succumb to the, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the world, and the pride of life. And all of these temptations are increased by the power of Satan. The world itself wants us 
to fall into temptation. But Satan, kind of uh, by his powers and through his ability to deceive, can make those pleasures look a lot more pleasurable and make those things look a lot more appetizing. And so you and I, if we're going to be rulers who serve, we need to rule over Satan. We need to rule over Satan as well. And that means that we need to not be ignorant of his devices. We need to be aware of when and how he works. The Bible says, be, ing be angry and sin not, neither give place to the devil. Well, wrath and anger can open up doors to Satan in our lives. And so God says, don't go to bed without correcting an issue with your loved one, with your spouse. It says, before you go to bed, make sure that you correct that issue. Why? Because when you go to bed and not correct that issue, you open up doors to develop things like envy, jealousy, malice, uh, anger, wrath, and all of these bitterness and other types of sins that can affect our soul. And so, again, as we close up here, my question is, what type of servant are you? What type of servant are you? Are you a servant that rules? If you're a servant that rules, then that means that you are serving others, you are serving God, you are serving truth. You're not going to compromise truth to serve others. You're not going to compromise truth to rule. You're going to serve God, serve others, and serve the truth. And if you are and I are servants who rule, we need to rule over self, rule over sin, and we need to rule over Satan. Again, Genesis 24, verse 2, Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. The more we learn to serve in a manner that serves others, God, and truth, the greater rulers God will make us in his world. Well, that's my daily nugget of wisdom. Be a servant who rules. Servants who don't rule are weak, they're unpredictable, they're inconsistent, undisciplined, and unfaithful. The Bible says confidence in an unfaithful man is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. You go, what, what does that mean? What in the world? Confidence in an unfaithful man is, is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. What is a broken tooth? A broken tooth is an annoyance. You try to eat food with a broken tooth. Let's say that you normally eat on one side of your mouth. But the, 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 the mean teeth that you use are broken. They're missing. They're broken. Now it's ineffective. It can't do what it was supposed to do. It's like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Imagine walking and your foot is out of joint. Your foot is not, your bones are not properly connected. They're not in the right place. Well, it makes the it makes the process of walking extremely difficult. It makes it very hard. God says, when you are relying on someone who is unfaithful, someone who is not reliable, someone that you can send to do a task who cannot be relied upon, they're like a broken tooth, tooth and a foot out of joint. And so when we are servants who don't rule, when we don't learn to rule ourselves, rule sin, and rule Satan. And by ruling Satan, we're also ruling those thoughts. We bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. When we don't learn to rule in that way, we serve in a manner that's weak, that's unpredictable, that's inconsistent, we're undisciplined, and we're unfaithful or and or rely, unreliable. And so, in other words, as you serve, never give up your dignity. Never give up who and what you are in Christ. In other words, you're an employee and you're supposed to serve. But that doesn't mean you are taken advantage of. You are a spouse. You are supposed to serve. That doesn't mean you allow yourself to be abused. You need to pray. You need to ask God for wisdom. You need to ask God for direction. You know, standing up for truth doesn't have to be arrogant doesn't have to be haughty, doesn't have to be resistive in a way. It can be respectable. You know, Jesus, well, I won't say more there. I'm tempted to, to think of some things there, but I'm not going to do it. But Jesus served. Jesus, but he also ruled. 
When he stood before Pilate, he said, you have no power over me except that which was given to you. As a servant, he never lost who and what he was in God. It didn't make him weak. He was, the me he was meek, but meekness is not weakness. All right, so servants who don't rule are weak, unpredictable, inconsistent, undisciplined, unfaithful. You're not ruling over others. You need to rule over self, sin, and Satan in your life. And I just chose three S's. But rulers who don't serve, rulers who don't serve others, who don't serve God, and who don't serve truth, end up compromising. They end up being rigid, end up being overbearing, domineering, insensitive to others, and this turns people off. And it doesn't matter if we are serving in the church, serving in the workplace, serving in the home, serving in our community, serving in society, serving in government. When we rule in a way that does not serve others, does not serve God, and does not serve the truth, we end up turning people away from the same, you know, turning people away from the, the authority that God has given us. All right, so that's my daily nugget of wisdom. I took a little bit longer than I wanted to because I, I was kind of fleshing it out as I went. But the text again that I used, if you're just coming in, is Genesis 24, 2. Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. So I was reading this yesterday, the phrase, servant of his house that ruled over all stood out to me. You can be a servant who rules. You don't have to be a servant that's weak, and you should be a ruler that serves. Samuel says, I think a lot of folks fail to see the dignity in servanthood. There are employers who look down on employees and employees who have, hated, who have hateful feelings toward employers. Both positions and submission to God are servanthood. Amen. We're all servants. We may not be aware of it. And um, when we don't submit ourselves to God's word and God's authority, we have consequences in this life and the next. And so you're right, brother. And so uh, God bless you all. Thanks for hanging out. And uh, uh, some of you came on a little bit late. And so um, I didn't have a chance to go through your command, your, uh, all of your, um, your, your responses. But remember, be a servant who rules. Serve others. Serve God serve the truth, which means when we serve the truth, we don't compromise the truth to please others. We must be submitted to the truth. We must be obedient to the truth. That means we must know what the truth is. Be a servant to God, a servant to others, a servant to truth, and rule over self, over sin, and over Satan, not people. God bless you. Have a great day. And if you keep these two things in mind, right, you'll find that uh, your life and your living is far more effective in whatever capacity you are called to rule. God bless you all.